Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we get to make small talk about the largest integrated health care system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Jennifer McDonald, Chief Consultant to the Deputy Undersecretary for Health. We will talk about how we've adapted to life in the pandemic and expanding care through the Mission Act. Enjoy the show. It's just a great opportunity to have you here and to shrink VHA down a little bit. Thanks. And, you know, I, it's an honor to be here, and I just love that this is happening. Um, you have such a way of connecting with people that now we get to do this and, and make the audience broader and bring people into a little bit of what we do here. I'm so happy this is happening. Great. Thank you. And it's, it's, this is to share a little bit what we kind of go through every day in chatting uh, and working through problems here in Central Office. So but before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, the first and most important thing about me is my family. Um, I have a, a husband who is a bit of a globe trotter um, and leads adventure tours around the world, um, has a much more exciting existence than I hold. Um, and two little ones, a son who's six and is heading into first grade and a daughter who's five and is going to start kindergarten virtually. She's a pandemic kindergartner wow. this year. Um, and other than that, um, I'm an army veteran and a family doc and both of those are part of what led me to VA. So you have a kid starting kindergarten in the middle of COVID. How is that going to work? My husband is an excellent human being. <laughs> That's primarily yes, how is, it's yeah. going to work and is going to share an office with a five and six year old. Um, and thankfully, she's a she's a joyful little one. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take Monday morning when school starts and make a big deal out of this and put her little backpack on and march down the hallway like it's like it's real. And, you know, hopefully have her brother hold her hand, that whole <laughs> that whole deal. Um, but just, you know, make make something out of this and, and yeah. make it fun. Um, and, you know, it, it, like for all of us, it's, it's been a balancing act these days. I mean, um, what, what has your balancing act been like? I know you're experiencing that, family, friends, taking care of, you know, people you served beside. I'm yeah. sure there's a lot going on for you, too. Yeah. No, there is a lot going on, just like everybody during this time. And I think everybody, you have to take a knee as an army, yeah. an army manicular. Yeah. Take a knee, drink yeah. some water, take a breath, relax. My thing has always been the outdoors. Right. And enjoying fly fishing and just being outside, even sitting on my mower on Saturday or Sunday has been great. And, um, you know, we we worked pretty hard here. We have worked hard. Uh, we worked, you know, six, seven, eight weeks, Saturdays and Sundays every day, just like many of our employees did and um, finding those opportunities. But the one thing I think that you always hit on is the camaraderie and the togetherness and the team that we have here. And so being able to rely on each other and have each other's backs really is what helps you to get through things like this. And I think that if you can't build a time, build a team in a time like this, I'm not sure exactly when you can build a team. So I always rely back on my team, my family as a team as well, and uh, that helps me to get through all this. Absolutely. Has your pup, has Maddie gotten used to the mower yet? No. <laughs> One day. Maddie, One day Maddie <laughs> just sits on the porch and barks at the mower. That's right. <laughs> but she's still a good dog. Right. And I'll just add that I had a root canal yesterday. So if you see some drool start running down, you can just wave me and I'll, I'll wipe it off. And Or if you can't understand what I'm saying, that might be part of it as well. So I got you covered on the medical front, but dentistry, great. I'm out of my element. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was fun. I'm glad it's over. Um, so one of the things I want to try and do on every one of these shows or podcasts is to get people to know a little bit about senior leaders, employees, and decision makers, and trendsetters throughout the organization, and of which you are one. Oh, and thanks. so one of th what we're going to do is ask some specific questions. Maybe they're a little corny, but I think it helps to show uh, the audience who you are, maybe just a little bit about you. So the first question is, and these are going to be rapid fire 30-second right, responses, maybe the first thing that pops into your head. What book, movie, TV show, et cetera, has, have, have, you had, have you seen, read recently that you would recommend to others, recommend to me, and why would you do that? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, these days there's not a whole lot of time for television, and so it's pretty much audiobooks on my way home. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and share. I'm a bit of a science fiction nerd, oh. so I am reading right now a book by N.K. Jemisin um, called *The City We Became*. It's about New York. Um, the characters go through some struggles, and really, I'm at the part in the book where they're kind of coming together to solve the major problem. Um, and I've found myself going between kind of 
comedy, science fiction, serious leadership books in this time, whatever yeah. the flavor needs to be for that given week. Um, but I love this one because it's um, it really is sort of a metaphor for what we're all doing here too, and coming together to you know solve something we've never seen before. Yeah, isn't and that true? And we're we're doing it. We we're are. doing it. <laughs> we are. Hey, speaking of books, and maybe an aside. Uh, did you read The Great Pandemic that Dr. Stone recommended? I did. Yeah. I so, did. So maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about how that came to be and what that was. And this is an aside off of these questions. but. Yes. Um, so, and I hadn't read that book before until Dr. Stone mentioned this, but it's really about the 1917-18 influenza pandemic. Um, and there are incredible parallels to now, um, at least for me, having, of course, never lived through something like this um, and wanting to really contribute to this leadership team in this time and this organization and really the, the country. It had some really incredible lessons in there about what to expect. I think some really inspiring stories, too, of, of how people came together and solved the problems then as well. Um, and, you know, my, my takeaway at the end of that really was that people found their way forward, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're a century later. We're past it. Yep. Um, the world has advanced and changed. And even though it might be hard to see now, we're going to get there, too. That's right. I look at that, think about that book all the time in that you see people wearing masks today. Masks, people wore masks during that time frame as well. And you know, yes. we don't remember wearing a mask in the 20s, 30s, 50s, right. 20, 2000s. And so it is possible we will get beyond it. We'll get to something else. Uh, what is something that's unique or interesting or a hobby that you have that people would be interested in? I am a musician, an amateur one, definitely an amateur one. Um, but I, I love to sing and write and play. Um, and a lot of times what that means now with the, with the kids in the house is that we are um, a very loud and not always <laughs> on the beat family band. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so you've got my, my daughter marching around with a tambourine and singing at the top of her lungs, and um, my son on the drums, like his dad, um, really with a penchant for the cymbals. Nice. And I need earplugs. Um, but I, I love to sing and write and play, and it's been really neat to see um, some of that shared from across the organization, too. It seems like um, there's just sort of a need for art and vibrancy in this yeah. time, and people are sort of finding a new their um, ability to do those things. So I love going home and playing the piano. That's fantastic. And I'm sure your neighbors in the middle of D.C. <laughs> love to hear the McDonald band play. Maybe or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> what lesson or piece of advice uh, have you received that you that stuck with you to this day? That's something that that you maybe share with people, or something that you think about often. Oh, these are good questions. Yeah, <laughs> this isn't some fly by night deal. Best, <laughs> best piece of advice. Um, you know, I'm going to go with follow your compass. Um, and I, I don't attribute that to a single person, but multiple people have said that and, and multiple people I look up to and really who have been mentors over the years have said that and I think you know especially in grappling something grappling with something like this time um, no matter how tough the day is if you have your mission your compass and your integrity at the end of the day you know you can wake up and do it again um, and you know you can keep driving on and um, I have really pondered that one and reflected on that over the last months I just can't be more true than that. And I think it's something that sticks with me from my, my time in the military as well. It's right. something that you're kind of focused in on, on, on doing the right thing and ethics and keeping your compass pointed north. And um, exactly. it's, it's a key to, I guess, who we are and kind of why people get into service like, like you do and like we do here in VA. So. So I'm not sure if people understand really what a chief consultant does. And so, I, you know, I introduced you as the chief consultant. What, what does that really mean and what does that mean to you? It means I knock on your door a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, can I have a minute? Um, no, it means, it means that I get to directly support Dr. Lieberman um, and work really hard to advance the leadership um, team's priorities and really work alongside the assistant undersecretaries for health, network directors, really the multiple levels of the organization with this team here, um, and really try to advance our strategic priorities. And, um, you know, I have a strange gravity to tough problems yeah. and, and really God. big opportunities, and I, I, I love it. And there's just, there's just such, I think, 
an ethos here um, that veterans come first. Our, you know, our our team members, employees, a very very close second, um, and that we're just driving toward excellence and really delivering on everything we can do. Um, and I just love I love being a part of that. It's so fulfilling. Well, we're so happy that you're involved with it and you've done some great things like Mission Act, Go Live. Oh, I know thanks. you're involved with caregivers and it's obvious all the things that's going on in COVID that you have had your hands in and be able to say, like you said, be able to solve problems. Uh, we are just you know, honored and blessed that you're here with us to do those kind of things. Thanks, definitely a, a team success. So you still practice medicine. I do, And yes. uh, obviously we did that for a reason. Um, and you are also a senior leader that works you know, ungodly hours <laughs> like the rest of us do. How do you kind of marry those two things together? Are you still able to practice? How often do you practice and what are, you know, those type of things? So I am actually just getting set up with telehealth um, on the West Coast. I'm so excited about this. Um, I have had privileges for the last few years at the DC VA um, and really love working with um, the fast track team in the ER there. Um, it's been such a great experience sort of bringing together what we do here in central office and then living it in the field, right? The, the decisions we make up here, I have to go and actually experience and live um, and make sure that, that those decisions that we make are the right, are the right ones for the people on the front line. Um, and I love that piece of it. You know, and beyond that, um, medicine is really what ended up leading me to VA, wanting to see that um, you know, U.S. healthcare could really strive forward and be even even more able to deliver for everyone in this country than than it was when I first started. And I really think that when VA leads, um, that the rest of the country gets better on that front, on a lot of fronts. Um, and so I love bringing together the strategic piece and the actual operations piece. And you know, there's just something about um, working alongside other clinicians too who are just going the extra mile day in and day out um, working those long hours but you know um, with a stethoscope and, and not behind a desk and and really just delivering for the people yeah. they care about I, I I love bringing those two together yeah I, that's a great thing about what we do and are allowed to do here in central office I think one thing that people may not know about you and you're way too uh, honorable to mention it yourself is that you actually interrupted medical school for you to deploy with the Army. Maybe you could share just a little bit about that because I'm sure people are interested in that. Oh, thanks. Um, you know, I was, I was that naive 17-year-old <laughs> joining the Army, didn't know much about the military or much about the world, frankly, and um, got in just, you know, leading up when I was 17, just after my 18th birthday, and actually September 11th had just happened. And what I found in the military was, was a family um, and people who really taught me my core values, you know, same, I'm, I'm sure for you, honor, professionalism, all the, all the real truths of mm -hmm. life I feel like I really found from that family um, and so when I started medical school um, got about halfway through and we learned that our unit was deploying to Iraq in 2009 um, had the had really the choice between staying home and and just continuing on that path toward medicine or going with who I considered my, my family um, overseas, and I went along, and my medical school was great about it, University of Minnesota. Um, they let me go and welcomed me back home, um, and so got to deploy. Thankfully, everybody in our immediate unit came home safe um, and finished, and then um, the rest is, rest is history. Went on from there, and happy to be here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I think that's an extremely honorable thing to do, and I know that there's oh, probably other people that may not have been able to complete medical school knowing that there has a, a break or this time that may have taken you away and focused something completely different. And anyway, thanks for what you've done, and thanks for your service to our nation. I appreciate you too. that. Yeah, you course. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're obviously dealing in the time of COVID and maybe you could describe what that means, what that meant to you and the things that you're doing in COVID and how it's looked for you as a senior leader here in VACO to, to deal when the, in the fight in COVID. 
You know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is, I, I know I keep saying this, but, but team, the way this team has pulled together and really looked at every angle of this. And it's always been, and I think, you know, I'll flatter you here, John, I'm, but it's the truth, um, that there's always a people first mentality. Yeah. And that's the way you lead. That's the way Dr. Stone leads. That's the way Dr. Lieberman leads. That's the way this team, that's just the ethos of this team, is it's constantly about people. And let's make central office work for the field. Let's make central office work in support of the field supporting veterans. Um, and let's make sure that the operations are making it easy on the front line, yep. as easy as this time can be, yep. at least easing the burden of it. Um, and I've gotten to be involved in some of the efforts around staffing and specifically DEMPS, um, you know, the Disaster Emergency Medical Personnel Service. And so, um, what I've, what I've gotten to see is some of the anecdotes coming from our staff, probably people watching right now who have deployed in support of our fourth mission and gone you know, to 46 states yeah. in D.C. Um, to support the Navajo Nation, to support the Indian Health Service and tribal communities. We crossed the 3,000 mark yesterday. Wow. 3,000 people saying, send me, send me. I'll go. Yep. Um, send me into additional harm's way and I'm going to take on this mission and I'm going to serve. Yeah. And it's just been a privilege to be a part of that. Well, it's also an honor to serve with people like that. Right. You know, it makes, it makes yes. it not only, it makes us easy for us to come in to work every day. And oh, absolutely. Your, your comments about people is, is what I feel personally, and I used to say this all the time in the Army, is that we don't develop widgets. We don't build widgets in right. the Army. We don't build widgets in VA. We provide health care. It's all right. about people. Yes. That's what we do is develop people and support people and, and you know, be with people. And, and then 3,000 volunteers decide that they're going to help somebody else someplace else. Right. Yeah, it's, it's just an honor to be involved in an organization that's like that. You mentioned about the Navajo Nation. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what's going on there and how we're providing care to, uh, there. Oh, sure. This is this has been so incredible. And, you know, VA's work during this time, as you well know, has been in in solid partnership with our not just our federal partners like the Indian Health Service, but also communities and specifically tribal communities. And so um, when we understood that the Navajo Nation was specifically and unfortunately affected by COVID-19 and that some additional support would be meaningful, um, we asked for volunteers and our nurses, our docs, our folks, raised their hands and said, yes, I will go. And um, they joined the the Indian Health Service and Navajo Nation clinicians to serve and make sure that Americans were taken care of um, and really made efforts to really respectfully learn the culture and provide culturally appropriate medical care um, and really came away from it. The anecdotes I've heard was that it was just so powerful and so meaningful and really gave our folks a sense of the VA mission that we all, you know, hold close to our hearts, but also this American mission um, and that we're, we're really doing this together side by side. There's been a lot of discussion lately, and I mentioned it the other day to uh, in uh, Chad Kessler's video series oh, right. about caregivers. <laughs> yes, that's great. Love what Chad's doing there. Um, about caregivers, and I know October 1st is our Caregiver Low Go Live, and I know you've been involved with it really since it pa passed into law and was signed by the president. So maybe you could describe a little bit about what's going on in the world of caregivers and our next iteration of what caregivers looks like. Yes. Oh, thanks for this. So um, there is a, a broad set of caregiver and social work services that VA provides. I think that's one of the things that's so unique about us. We're not just health care, but we take care of the whole person. And what's expanding is the specific program that supports caregivers with a stipend um, and really has welcomed in post 9-11 era veterans. And now we have the opportunity to expand to pre-1975 era veterans, so Vietnam, Korea, World War II, um, and two years later it'll expand to all veterans and the entirety of the folks that we serve will be eligible to apply for the program. And one of the things that I think is just so compelling um, is, you know, I'm, I'm guessing this is similar for you. Some of the people who have had the, the largest effect on my life are Vietnam veterans yep. um, or Korean War veterans. And um, what this gives us the ability to do and really the thoughtfulness that the caregivers team has put into this and designing it and working with VSOs and working with Congress and other stakeholders, really listening to veterans is one of the changes is that um, whether 
a, let's take a Vietnam veteran as an example, has a serious illness or an injury. So whether they, um, you know, had, had an injury that's related to their service or whether it's an illness now, but let's say, you know, someone had a blast injury back in Vietnam before traumatic brain injury was even a term. And so it wasn't recorded. Right. Up till now, we might not have been able to include that person in the program. What this team has done is open that window and now if that veteran is experiencing the after effects of that injury that was maybe never written down but we know it happened, then they're included in the program. And we're able to just really look at the whole person once again and take care of people. And I'm, I'm excited to see this roll out. I think they will you know, hit the ground running on October 1st and, and keep enhancing from there and this is going to be a really great thing. Yes, it, it, it is an exciting time to be able to expand that to additional cohort of veterans and their caregivers. Yeah. And I know it's been a lot of work, a lot of work behind the scenes, and uh, we appreciate all that you've been doing and continue to do for that and all the other issues and fronts that you can continue to work on. Thanks. So on that note, I want to thank you for coming and thank, thank you for you. Uh, joining me on this first episode. Uh, anything left you want to add or share with anybody before we go? You know, I was... I was just going to add one thing, and that's that um, you know we've we've talked a little bit about managing this time and and um, coming together as a team. And um, my hope when people see something like this and see you taking the lead to really connect with others is that um, people follow that and and find the spaces where you know whether it's music or the family band or whatever it is, find the spaces where. You, you draw your energy and take a little bit of that time to um, allow yourself to process this time. Um, find that source of energy and at least at least for me, you know, as, um, as hard as the balancing act is sometimes during these days, and I'm sure so many people watching that share that, um, as hard as the balancing act is, I do it all again. I know we've talked about this, um, you know, Drawing that energy from those sources and those people that allow you to keep going is, is what I hope people take away from this and, and really see in your leadership, because yeah. I do all the time. Well, I appreciate that very much. Thank you again for joining us, and I appreciate you being the first guest, and hope everybody learned a lot of great things about what you're doing, why you do them, and who you are. And uh, I, know, I know I did, and I appreciate so much working with you and being allowed to work with you every day and accomplishing the missions here. Thank you for listening. I look forward to our next episode, and remember, we're all in this together. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Remember, September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So be on the lookout for our next episode where we get a chance to chat with Dr. Matt Miller, Director of the Office of Suicide Prevention. See you next time.